Hello everyone and welcome to another collab. Uh, this one is actually pretty special. A lot of you guys have asked me a s interesting question and that is what happened to Eric from CRM's channel. Uh, well, Eric is now known as Watch Eric on YouTube and he's no longer with CRM. Now, you know I'm not the guy to talk shit or speculate on what happened and so on and so forth. So I, I got at least seven or eight questions from you guys. Hey, do you know what happened with Eric and CRM? What happened, what happened, what happened? And uh, rather than responding myself and not knowing what happened, I obviously spoke with Eric on the side, but I felt that it wasn't fair for me to speak on his behalf. So rather than doing that, I decided to invite Eric to the show. So guys, welcome. Watch Eric. What's up, Eric? How are you? Hey, Roman. How are you doing, man? Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. So one of the things I felt that was fair and... If you guys have already resubscribed to Eric's channel, which is Watch Eric, you probably kind of know what happened, but Eric never really spoke about exactly what happened. Or Eric is also a very humble guy. He's not the one to talk shit about anyone. But at the same token, uh, something obviously did go down to, that made him go out on his own and start a humongous journey from scratch. Mind you, this is the guy that took that channel to 100,000 plus subscribers, which is very difficult to do on YouTube, especially in our space, because our space is so small to begin with. So smooth. Yes, if you're talking makeup tips, or if you're talking cooking tips, or gardening tips, it's very easy to grow a YouTube channel. In the watch space, to get to 100,000 is nearly impossible, and believe me, I know it took me almost two years to get to 30,000 subscribers. But enough about me, First question that all of you guys ask is what happened to Watch Eric? So Eric, could you please tell mine and your audience what happened with Eric? Well, it's very simple, you know. Um, it's, a, I would say, not touchy, but just a sensitive situation just because I've been with them so long. And, uh, you know, when I started with Carlos, uh, it was really just me and Carlos. And it was a very small outfit. I think he had maybe 5,000 followers on Instagram. That was back when Instagram was the wild, wild west. You could grow a channel or I mean a page overnight on Instagram. Uh, now it's obviously a lot harder, but um, we put in a lot of work and uh, it was actually a great ride, great journey. But um, what happens is uh, this year in April, I turned actually 38 years old and um, I started thinking about it. I said, you know, I've been with them eight years. We've accomplished a lot. I've met a lot of people, met a lot of great clients along the way. And I thought, you know, when is it going to be my time to do my own thing? Um, and I figured, I said, you know, it's either now or never. I don't want to wait another 10 years till I'm 48, pushing almost 50, to do my own 100% independent business. So I figured now's the moment. Um, little weird timing with this whole global scenario, to not say exactly that word, but, um, but that was actually just coincidental because when I talked to them, it was uh, a good four weeks before it really started knocking on everybody's door here in the U.S. And it was just timing. And that's what pretty much really what went down is just it's time for me to do my own thing and start my own channel and um, business as well. A lot of people were speculating also in the comments and, um, you know, even CRM themselves you know, I don't know how they felt about that, but because a lot of people thought I was the owner of CRM. Um, look, I worked there, 100% put all my drive, motivation, heart, and everything into that place. So, you know, I treated it like if it was my own. I never told anybody I owned the place. By all means, I mean, people would come in and be like, you're the owner? And I'm like, nope, he's right there, that's Carlos. But yeah, a lot of people, you know, perception is reality. So you do something online and people start to think something and assume things. Well, you never, you never actually, you never actually in any one of your videos ever put forth uh, an idea that you may be a partner, an owner, or anything like that. And I've done business with CRM over the years. Obviously, I knew who the owner was, but I also knew who the number two guy was. Whether or not your name was on the papers, I know you definitely treated that business as if it was your own because that's just your personality. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I got a lot of comments and, you know, the comments are still going and people just want to know. And, and I was actually tempted to do something to tell the people you know i had guys even write and say hey man i've been following you for six years and i feel like the fans deserve to know what happened and i'm like i really wanted to be like nothing really happened like there was no drama it was just a moment um you know there comes a moment in life as a man that you just decide you know i got to do my own thing and i want to take it to the next level i just felt that i had already reached the highest potential that i could get being there um, now on my own, it's the sky's the limit. I can tap new boundaries, uh, do more things on YouTube and just take it to the next level. And that's what I'm on the path to do. 
So Eric, what you just said, actually, I can relay in a couple of scenarios. I'm not going to get into the story of, uh, you know, how I came into the watch business, how I chose to leave my corporate career and go on my own. But what you said in regards to going on your own, being your own man, has lots and lots of benefits to it. Obviously, there's also downsides to it. When you work for someone else, you usually don't have a worry in the world, but you're not that kind of person. I know that you care for that business as if it was your own. But at the same token, going out on your own, you know, you take the good with the bad because you know that if you messed up, it's on you. If you do well, it's on you. But I feel like the motivational factor can almost quadruple as motivated as you thought you were while working at CRM for almost 10 years, I think you'll find that your motivation is gonna go through the roof once you're working for yourself because now it's the fruits of your own labor directly from you to you, if that kind of makes sense. As far as control, for example, within our company, among all the departments, we do have certain control. We have management that writes certain standard operating procedures of how things should be done. Now you get to do that on your own. And the best part about it, even when I opened up my own YouTube channel, even though I'm the owner, you know, I still had my marketing and creative department come to me and say, hey, Roman, you know, we need a face of the company, you know, a lot about watches, start sharing some of that experience, to which my response was, I'm not gonna have it done by a script, right? Me and you didn't script any of this, I don't script any of my videos. I talk off the top of my head and I feel it comes out best and, and genuine that way. So, but now you have no creative control because having to have worked for someone there's always that, oh, Eric, let's throw these watches up on YouTube because these are the ones that we just got in and we want to sell, right? There's none of that. And I've watched already some of your videos uh, that you've put out on your new channel. And I see that now you sort of have that relaxed freedom of creativity about you at this point, because again, you're not controlled. You are controlling the content that you're putting out. And I think that's also very important. And I can certainly relate to that because I basically told my marketing or my CMO to go scratch. I said, I'm going to get on camera. I'm going to tell it like it is. And I think that's part of the reason my channel became successful over the last couple of years. Uh, I guess the next question is, uh, well, guys, outside of you going on YouTube, obviously, this is also you moving to work for your own in the watch industry. So all you guys watching out there, Eric is not just opening up a new YouTube. Eric is opening up a new office, right? Tell me about that. Where are you in Miami? What's going on? Tell the people. Plug yourself, I guess. Okay, correct, man. I mean, um, although I worked with CRM Jewelers the whole time, I also had my own inventory that I would sell there at the store um, in consignment. So, I mean, I've always bought, sold, and trade watches. See, I, didn't, I did not know that. Yeah, I've always had also my private clients that had nothing to do with CRM as well. Um, that I would also sell watches to. So now that I'm my own, um, I'm actually gonna be in the Cebo building, uh, the famed Cebo building, you know, Miami, everybody. That's the first question they ask you. Yeah, there's like, there's like 40,000 dealers in one building. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna be there, it's called Select Time Pieces. That's gonna be pretty much what the name of the business is gonna be in the sense of if you're gonna write a check or something of that nature. But really the brand is gonna be Watch Eric. You know, um, what I'm gonna promote the most is gonna be Watch Eric. And that's going to be the face of everything and the brand, you know, it's just Watch Eric. So um, it's actually exciting, you know, now that I'm on my own, um, the difference I can see is, you know, there was a lot of volume of questions to handle because of the social media being so big in the previous place that I worked. Um, you know, there was just an incredible amount of leads to tackle. Um, some are good, some are bad, but that's in the nature of any business in sales. Um, the good thing about now is that I feel that I'm able to give more of a personalized service to my clients, like a lot more chill and relaxed and really go over what they want and just give them a better entire start to finish experience than before. Um, instead of having to sell X amount a month, I could do a lot less and give more of a personalized experience. That's one of the main things that I like about it. And it makes it more enjoyable for the client and for me. Well, I'll tell you one thing. First of all, I'm going to give you a little bit of advice uh, in regards to the personalized side of things. For 18 years, uh, I st 18 years later, I still have uh, clients' phone numbers in my cell phone that call me, that text me, and do that stuff every day. With the growth of the YouTube channel, one of the biggest challenges I found was, again, that personal touch that you're talking about. Uh, it's it, it, after a certain volume, it becomes next to impossible, right? I'm, I already get an amount of emails that I can barely handle, so I have a girl that's helping me out with that. And one of the things that I had most trouble with about fifth year into the business where 
when people called me, they wanted to talk to Roman Sharf, Roman Sharf, Roman Sharf. When I started, when I started hiring salespeople, when I started hiring mm -hmm. people to help me out, assistants and things of that nature, I had some clients that actually got offended, you know? Uh, so what I managed to do is I managed to figure out a type of atmosphere within the business where even if I cannot be on the phone, even, even, even if I cannot be face to face with that particular client, I figured out a way to at least train my staff to ensure that every single client still gets that personalized business. I still get people that get pissed off at me, don't get me wrong. Oh, I wanted to talk to you, you passed me off to Adrian or Anna or, some, or Devin or whoever else. And you know, I try to make them understand as much as possible because at the end of the day, the biggest challenge you're gonna face is now you're not just the face. You're not just a knowledge base for them. You're not just a, their salesperson. You're now also an owner of a business, which you're going to in turn grow, which in turn is gonna require a lot of other effort that you're normally not used to. So I think that you know once you get into a position where you're gonna start hiring help and having people helping you out around the office and things of that nature, ensure that you grow it as a family so that nobody loses sight of your statement, which is exactly what you made. Personalized, face-to-face, -face, I wanna pay attention to my clients and things of that nature. There's going to be times where you won't be able to do that. So whatever you do, and this took me a while to figure out and get the right people under me to be able to do that, but never lose touch of that personalized experience. Till this day, you, new clients from YouTube, old clients from God knows how long ago, I still try to do my best to chime in here and there. And even if I do pass them on to an employee or a salesperson or someone else, I ensure that, that person put forth that same personalized touch, or I'm gonna call it that same standard, right, that your clients expect from you. I think that's gonna be one of the bigger challenges for you going forward. Actually, yeah, that, that's gonna be some great advice, you know, because it's, it is gonna be a challenge. At some point, there is gonna be such a large volume and there are people that are gonna to wanna to deal with me directly. So yeah, I mean, it's gonna, like any new business, there's gonna be some hurdles and that's one I'm gonna to have to work with and that's great advice. I need to find somebody at some point and be able to extend that experience beyond just me so that that way they feel like they're, you know, buying from me when they kind of aren't, you know, directly at least. One of the, one of the things that you're going to have is what, I, I mean, I kind of have it, but I don't have it because of my location. I'm located in the suburbs of Philadelphia, right? And it's not like I'm on a prominent street or a prominent building such as the Seabolt building in Miami. So I do get some face-to-face -face clients that do make it here from time to time, but for you, it's going to be a lot of fun because now, Look, people stop me on the street, they wanna take a picture with me, they wanna have a chat with me because they recognize it because they follow me on YouTube. I've been stopped as close as New York City as far as LA, Hong Kong, and Dubai, right? And I love that stuff because I love actually seeing people face to face because look, let's face it, at the end of the day, me and you right now are staring at a camera with a light around it, you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> yeah. It seems like it's personal, yeah. but it's really not. So I absolutely absolutely love that. I think you have, you're gonna have an opportunity to uh, have a lot more of that than I get to have because again, not a lot of people, there's not a lot of foot traffic in my office. So another thing I would love to see, and this is what people love to see when I go do like the travel vlogs and I go to the trade shows and I do buying and selling, I think the store itself uh, in the Seabill building is gonna provide you with an opportunity to provide the type of content that most wouldn't wanna do. And because you're already a veteran on YouTube, you know, I'm, I still consider myself a rookie, but because you're already a YouTube veteran, I can only imagine what, what type of content can come out of that. When you actually have clients that wanna be on camera with you, that wanna come out to your store just to shoot the shit, regardless of whether they're buying something or not, I think you got a huge opportunity for the type of content that not a whole lot of guys out there can put out because some of the stuffy, fancier stores, they don't know a thing about video production to begin with, but me and you, you know, outside of sitting behind a desk and talking about watches, which by the way, I'm low-key jealous because I don't get to go outside all year round with fucking palm trees and beautiful blue skies and boats going by, right? And, and beautiful water, right? Because I'm like in an industrial park, but, yeah. but that's a side point. But I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunity for, uh, for the type of content that YouTube hasn't seen yet. In fact, I know that the next time I'm in Miami, I'm gonna be in your store with a vlogging camera. We're gonna sit down, shoot the shit talk watches it just makes it that much more interesting so i think that's another great thing that can come out of your channel something that i didn't see you do much of in crm but again it wasn't your show so it wasn't your call you know yeah i mean there was obviously some you know i had to i i mean how can i say i was i came up with pretty much every single topic that was on that previous show yeah there was times 
you when you come out with so many different topics, you'll reach a moment where you're just like, what do I do now? I've done every single AP almost. I've done almost every Rolex. And yeah, we did have a couple of meetings where I sat there and collectively said, anybody have an idea? And someone would say, well, how to wear a watch? And I'd say, okay, well, maybe I can do a spin on that. But, uh, but the content was really, I created it. And um, what happens is that now I have the freedom to create whatever content I want. If I want to feature one of my you know, clients that has a really exotic car, something really special, and he's buying a watch, and we want to make it a bit more of a blend and more of a lifestyle thing, I can do that. And interesting enough, when you said about people noticing you, you know, initially when I first started doing YouTube, um, the guy that did the marketing for me, you know, over there at CRM came and said, you know, you should do a video on YouTube. And my reaction was, that's a stupid idea. Honestly, that's, that's, that's what I thought, you know, because there was just so much on my plate at that moment that I thought a video on YouTube. And then why? Because like you said earlier, you know, this is a very niche channel market. It's not like you know, we're not comedians, we're not stuff like that, that pranksters, people that get a ton of views. So I thought, you know, who really wants to see that? So I did my first couple videos and then I started running into clients that didn't know what they were buying and they were making some big mistakes. And I thought, you know what, this could be helpful for people to guide them through this haunted house of buying watches blind. So at least they know which way to go. And from there it started to develop. And then what you had said about people recognizing you, you know, it's funny because I do a lot of my videos outside in different parts of Miami. And even I've done a couple videos in different states and it just doesn't fail. Um, I don't think about this and I don't even think about this at all, but I'll be somewhere and randomly somebody will recognize me and be like, hey, you're the guy from YouTube. I watch your videos. Sometimes, sometimes people remember my name. Sometimes they remember CRM or, or anything, but they'll say, you're the guy that does the watches. And my videographer told me one time that um, he said, you know, for every person that recognizes you, there's going to be three or four that probably didn't want to say anything. And I mean, I'm like that too. I'll run into somebody that might be famous. I'm not going to say anything. So it, it's actually a lot of exposure and it's actually good to see that people actually watch it and all the positive feedback is, is very good. One, one, of the things that, uh, one of the things that I kind of have in the back burner uh, is, uh, is I plan on doing a, a face-to-face, -face, a GTG, I guess is the buzzword, right? To get together with some of these collectors. And uh, at first I thought about it doing it in Philadelphia, but then I honestly felt that either Miami, New York, or Vegas would probably be a good choice. So, so maybe some, sometime in the future, we can get uh, a room of guys together, you know, watch collectors, to just sit there and shoot the shit about watches, you know? Those are, those, are, those are the kind of things. And again, to me, Doing YouTube is extremely, extremely satisfying. Uh, the results I get are extremely satisfying. The feedback that I get is extremely satisfying. Uh, but it's still, again, me and you sitting and staring at a camera, and there's nothing like having a live conversation with a collector, uh, especially when somebody bumps into me. I make sure I spend the time to sit and at least talk to them for five to ten minutes if I can, uh, you know, just to get that live interaction. I think that. Uh, some of the stuff I started doing recently, which is the real, um, real people, real watches, real stories, where people are actually sending me submissions, is giving me a little bit more satisfaction. Where I'm seeing my, I'm seeing my YouTube fans, I'm seeing their watch collections. But certainly in the future, I think we should think about doing an actual legit get together. And at the end of the day, suburbs of Philadelphia, are, eh? But I think if I, if we announce this for Miami, I think we'll get a lot of guys that are going to want to come down there, or girls for that matter. Let's talk about. Let's talk about something else for a minute. Let's, uh, let's talk about, you know, I, I put out a video three months ago. I caught a lot of heat over it that I said, coronavirus is not as bad as the 2008 crisis. And I went through that. I, we've gone through corona as we speak. I caught a lot of heat saying, oh, you're downplaying this terrible disease. And I, to which my response was, no, I'm not playing down anything. I'm strictly talking about watches. Don't mix the two together. Yeah, correct. You're, you're saying in the watch market, of course. Yeah. Last week I talked about, look, uh, guys, I'm sorry to say this, but I told you so. Because right now what I'm seeing in the market as far as Rolex prices, AP prices, Richard Mille prices, paddock prices, it's absolutely ridiculous. And I'm sure you're going to back me up on this to say that I think we already... Uh, the corona pricing lasted among dealers when the panic set in for guys like me even that hold large inventories like oh shit, this stuff is going to go down let me start dumping the stuff yeah we saw about a 10 to 20 percent price decrease and then literally overnight it went back to where it was and i feel like 
we're higher than pre-corona prices right now, especially on sports Rolex again, once again. And again, all your hot stuff. Where are you seeing the market right now? I mean, I'm finding it difficult to buy stuff. Honestly, it's, it's not the correction in the market that we were expecting at all. Um, I actually had just recorded a video for my YouTube about this um, because, you know, people, I did, I did a video too about the, the prices were dropping down and everybody starts, and I was saying that they dropped, but it was just a little bit of a kick. And people are like, oh, you know, there were economists were going on there and writing giant paragraphs saying that the ripples are not felt and then the market and then this. I said, look, what I'm just saying is, I was expecting to get some deals. You know, I was excited. I thought maybe I can get a blue Sky Dweller steel for about $9,000, but um, it never happened. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, just, I, just saw one this, I just saw one this morning for 24 as a favor. Yeah. You know, I saw, I think that the panic sell-off lasted between dealers and privates for about a week or two. And then things kind of straightened out. And like, at least here in the U.S., because I can't say what's going on in other countries because I live here. But at least here in the US, it's not the correction we were expecting. There's nothing to buy. Like I have not found any watches. You know, I was expecting, okay, let me get liquid. Let's get ready to buy merchandise. Nothing. You know, I've tried to buy watches off people and they're actually holding. So um, it's just pretty remarkable um, how strong watches are, even though there are a lot of people that don't believe in watches. You know that, you know, there's guys that don't believe in it. But, um, and I do agree that this is different than 2008. I feel like 2008 was a very large problem that came from within the economy. You know, real deep into the economy at its core is when it blew up. I mean, this is kind of an exterior problem. Nevertheless, it's still a big problem, but I haven't seen the market fall yet. <laughs> I haven't. Yeah, I felt, I felt like the core difference between 08, and this is, I think I said that on my video, the core difference between 08 and what's happening now is in 08, nobody saw a light at the end of the tunnel. The wheels stopped, everything stopped, everybody stopped, and they didn't know that, oh, on such and such date, we're going to reopen bars. On such and such date, we're going to reopen beaches. We're going to do this. You know, right here, this is something that happened, and everybody understands that it's temporarily, where in 2008, people thought this, uh, you know, recession or borderline depression could have lasted a long time. You know, we got out of that pretty quickly as well. Took about, but it took about six months for business to go back to normal for me, six to nine months back then. Uh, Let's, let me ask you another question. Here's a, here's a, a discussion I had with uh, Adrian, uh, uh, I think a couple of days ago. We talked about paddock, right? And specifically, you know, today, especially among dealers, uh, we're, you know, you think paddock, what are you looking at? You're thinking Nautilus and Aquanaut, right, at best. Yeah. Long story short, Adrian telling me that he feels that the market is going to swing back to where it was in, uh, you know, early somewhere around 2010, 2011, uh, prior to the 08 crisis, where he feels that the trends are gonna slowly go back to your 5270s, 5970s, your perpetual calendars, your annual calendars, some of the more complex stuff from them, some of the dressier stuff from them, because he feels that slowly but surely, the Nautilus line and the Aquanaut lines is pricing itself out of the market where we, we're reaching ridiculous prices on 5711s and 5980s and, th and 5990s and things of that nature, where I've gotten to a point where I almost feel bad charging somebody 95000 for 5990 because I feel like it's already way too expensive. And he feels that that may be the reason where you're going to start seeing some of the oldies but goodies coming back and that's their dressy complicated line. Like today, 5270 platinum we received, right? And we have a 5270 in white gold, right? Well, that one sold actually already. But the 5270, you know, for 150,000 roughly, you're getting a platinum perpetual calendar chronograph, right? From Patek Philippe. What do you feel? Do you think that we're gonna ride the Nautilus wave for a while? Or do you think there's room for the dressy side of Patek Philippe, what Patek Philippe truly is, or the majority of their lines yeah. are? to come back, come back a bit stronger. You know, that's, that's actually a good um, topic of conversation that Adrian brought up. Um, you know, I feel that with the buyers that are out there, they're either gonna A, get turned off by the prices and move on, or what happens is, is that at some point, like any trends, right now the Nautilus and the Aquanaut is hot because it's sporty, this and that. Well, trends pass and people get bored. Yes, the Nautilus and the Aquanaut are going to be iconic forever, I believe. But I also think that when collect, you know, it's almost like a gateway for these hardcore collectors. They want the Nautiluses, they want the Aquanaut. And then once you have it for a while, 
where do you go from there? So I think at some point they might start now venturing to the other models, which are a bit more, you know, more conversation piece. You know, nowadays a 5990, not that there are a bunch of them out there, but, you know, when everybody has them in your office or whatever crew you run around, you know, what is the next step? You know, it's like trends, man. Every, everything is always going to be another trend to follow. So when will the Nautilus and Aquanaut burn out? Um, I think it's hard to say. Um, I think that eventually the people that are getting into it now, look, six, seven years ago, you know, there wasn't the hotness, you know, the Nautilus wasn't as hot as it is right now. It's not like, oh, Nautilus, Nautilus. There was people that didn't even like it. They said, no, I don't like that watch. I wouldn't even buy it. Now people want it just because it's a Nautilus, you know, oh my God. I've always liked the way it looked. And because there's a, there's a, there's a 20,000 year wait list for it too, you know what I mean? People will either get burnt out of that, they don't want to wait the time or pay, and then the people that did pay and can get them or whatever, where do you go from there? I mean, it's not like, you know, how many more variations of the Nautilus can you come out with before you burn the model out? And Patek is very conservative and I don't think they will burn it out. So they'll probably jump to the next thing, which is going to be more of a dressier model with more complications and stuff like that. And, and I agree, trends change, man, just like the chains. You know, there was an era where people were using all these fancy links, and then that died out and it went to Cuban link again. And then it, it will always circle back again, like any trend out there. Remember the stackable braces for men? That, that died quickly. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to what you said and... and you know, I think that, look, for me, you know, I look at a lot of things from a historical perspective. To me, 5711 is an iconic watch because it was designed by Gerald Genta, which I think is one of the greats in the industry, if not the greatest, right? So to me, uh, you know, Nautilus is always going to be there. But I think what a lot of viewers need to understand, because I don't want anybody to panic and say, oh, my God, they're all going to go down in value and crash no. and burn. They're not. <laughs> because panic is not stupid either. Look what they did with the 5711 with the white dial, discontinued. What do you think is going to happen next? They're going to ride the wave until they feel, because believe me, they know what the gray market does on a daily basis. They're going to ride the wave until they feel that we've gotten to a point where it might take a downward swing, and they'll just discontinue a model. Correct. And they'll come out with something else. So... For those of you guys that are out there picking up these iconic pieces saying, you know, I always tell you watches are not an investment, but don't think that all of a sudden your 5711 that you may have paid $65,000 for is going to go down to twenty or 30000 That's never going to happen just because of the market price that was set. Keep in mind that majority of these watches are not sitting in Patek Philippe boutiques. They're sitting with guys like me and Eric. And if we paid fifty-five thousand or sixty thousand for an Nautilus to sell it to you for sixty-five or seventy, whatever the market price may be, that doesn't mean all of a sudden I'm going to lower my price and lose thirty grand on my watch. Yeah, of course. That's a vicious cycle that only Paddock can stop by discontinuing the pieces, and when they do that, it goes through the roof anyway. So, I do think that Adrian does have a good point, and and I guess part of me wants to agree with him simply because I don't understand why somebody would pay a hundred grand for a stainless steel watch when there's a perpetual calendar chrono available an annual calendar chrono things that are more complicated we did lose sight of a lot of the collectors nowadays go for a lot of hype and something that they can't have and i always say there's absolutely nothing wrong with that i like to wear the hype watches i like to drive a nice car or wear nice clothing it goes in line hand in hand but at the end of the day, I still, as a watch nut at heart, because I am a watch guy, I still sometimes, it hurts my heart, literally, to see, uh, you know, uh, an, an older Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Turbion in rose gold go for under $100,000, but yet I got a guy to just pay me $170,000 for Bubba Watson. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. That's the kind of, it hurts me on a personal level, but I do at the stand at the same time. We got to show the audience what's on our wrist. What are you wearing, Eric? Um, I'm actually wearing an AP41 rose gold blue dial perpetual calendar. Love that watch. I love the size of it. I, my wrist is a, little, a bit smaller, so I, like, I tend to like some of the older perpetuals. He's wearing my favorite brand, and I'm surprised I also have an AP on my hand, and this is an oldie but a goodie. This is the rose gold Alinghi, a watch that did take a dump since it came out. I mean, this watch was trading as high as 85000 when it first came out, and today you pick him up in like a mid-30s to $40,000, but... I still love the watch. I love the combo of black and rose. So just like, just like any Royal Oaks, I like in black or blue dial on rose. Dark dial against rose gold, I think something about that that AP does, I think is pretty wonderful. But let's get back to Richard Meals. Um, right now, we talked about shortage of product, right? And the thing of it is, I find it, this, I find it like this. When I do, I've had, in the last week, we had six or seven Richard Meals come through. I think I'm down to one. 
And I'm finding the same exact thing. I'm finding it hard to buy product. Prices are holding. Again, one of those I told you so, guys. I know this because the market is so controlled with that by the company as well as the guys that own these things. Uh, and you guys have asked me numerous times, is Richard Mille a bubble? And numerous times I've told you I don't have a glass ball, but I'm based on my opinion, it's not a bubble. It's going to continue going the way it's going because some of the new stuff that they keep coming out with is just fire. And it's, 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 they're amazing watches. Yeah. They're well-made watches. But I'm finding it hard to buy product. How about you, Eric? You know what? Um, it's the same thing for all of the brands that I sell, which is mostly Rolex, Audemars, Patek, and Richard Mille. There's just not a lot around. And, um, you know, it's just one of those watches that I don't see it as a bubble. Um, a bubble to me would be something that rose to such a high price, exploded, and then it's worth nothing. Um, there could be always a chance that it could, uh, I don't know, lose twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. Maybe it could be a correction in the market. But I'll never, I don't ever foresee ever a richer mill that you can pick one up for $20,000. Like, that's not going to happen. Somebody asked me that question. I said, yeah, good luck. You're going to be waiting a long time yeah. to find a richer mill. As opposed to some of these brands that have actually burned themselves out to the point where, you know, you pay pennies on the dollar. I don't see that happening because, one, the people that buy them, the most part, for the most part, the people that buy Richard Mill are, are not stupid people. I mean, you know, they can, you can criticize however you want to look at it. Um, you're not saving up your lunch money to buy a Richard Mill. You know, they know what they're doing. And not to mention, they're buying it because they like it. So they'll take that risk. They know what they're getting into when they buy that watch. They know that anything could happen. It's like anything you buy in this world. You know, you buy a fancy one of one race car and you decide you want to drive it on a track one day you know you could crash it and it could be gone that that's part of the risk that they take when they buy these things so i don't see it blowing up and um you know there could be a correction in the market and it's probably going to happen if it ever does to a lot of different watches not just richard mill and right now it's hard to get watches i mean i feel like whoever has their watches is holding on to them um and, you know, the same thing that I said earlier has applied also to Richard Mille. I, I've been looking for a couple models myself, and I haven't found them for clients. And if they have them, they're really expensive, you know, more than I expected. That's part of the reason why the prices are climbing a little bit. And because what happens is here you have a client who is really, really hard up for, let's say, an RM67 or whatever it might be, right? And if for an RM67, if we know the market is anywhere from 180 to 200, and you have a client, listen, Eric, I don't give a what you do. I want this watch to wear next weekend at a car rally or something because all my boys have them and I don't have one. Which is usually the way they are. And then you're saying to yourself, well, shit, what do I do? You reach out to a client who you may have previously sold the watch to. And now, you, you know, let's say the client six months ago, if the market, let's say it was 170, the guy paid you 175 for it, let's say. Now you're saying, you say, I'm going to give you 185 and then you're going to charge the other guy, let's say five grand or 10 grand. You mark up, you put your markup on that. That kind of tends to drive the price up. But you also mentioned one very good thing, and that was the fact that, look, there's always corrections in the market based on outside factors, right? Whatever it might be. And these watches, you mentioned the number of 20, 30,000. People are saying, oh my God, that's a lot of money. Yes, it would be a lot of money if you bought a $50,000 watch. But when you're looking to buy a watch, I mean, my average ticket in Richard Mille is over 200 at this point. It used to be around 150, yeah. 130, now it's over 200. So when you're buying a, a, a ticket that's $200,000, what is $30,000? Right, it's 15% loss. And it's funny that people don't mind taking a 15, 20, sometimes even a 30% loss when they buy a three to $5,000 watch, right? But because it translates into so much money on a $200,000, all of a sudden it seems like, oh my God, this is huge, but it's not, it's the same thing. Because me and you, I know I look at percentages, I don't look at the dollar amounts because that's how yeah. I look at my profits and everything else. So a 20, $30,000 hit on the $200,000 watch is not so bad, at the same token, the Audemars I mentioned earlier, right? The, the Rose Gold Royal Oak, I'll have Ian pop it on the screen. Rose Gold Royal Oak Turbion Chronograph from Audemars. A watch that retails for 230 some thousand. Beautiful watch. It, it's a beautiful watch. The market on us was anywhere from 100 to 140, depending on condition and depending on the times, right? And now it has dropped below uh, 100. Well, the watch got old for one. It became old news, so to speak. And the size. If you're somebody that bought that for 160 or 150,000 and now that watch is worth 80,000, yes, that's a huge hit percentage-wise, money-wise as well. But 
Again, it goes back to what I always say. You know, you buy what you like first and foremost. There's absolutely nothing wrong buying into hype things if you can afford them, obviously. Buy within the means that you can afford. But there's just as much hype around $3,000 two-doors as there is, or probably even more, than there are around Richard Meal. But I think these guys are here to stay. I am very, very curious where they're gonna be in terms of innovation. Uh, you know, somebody actually asked me that question. Is there any room to innovate in terms of material? And over the last few years, I, I have to give it to Richard Meals when it comes to innovation in terms of use of material, you know, starting with the crystal, right? Uh, then going to NTPT and various uses of carbon. Yep. I'd be very curious to see what Richard Mill has, uh, you know, sort of in store for us over the next two to three years because they're gonna continue reinventing themselves, I feel like. Absolutely, man. They're gonna be coming out with more stuff. I mean. Even like when you see those watches that have the shock meters or the G-force meters and stuff like that, I was like, man, who comes up with that? You know, that's something that wasn't originally done in, you know, in horology and watchmaking and stuff like that. And they come out with stuff like that. You know, they're definitely a different brand. You know, all the guys that they have endorsing the brands, like all their athletes and stuff like that, like they really have some ridiculously good people that they push their product and that endorse their products, you know, they know what they're doing. I've always felt like Richard Mill was a small company, but like a huge brand because they're not really a big, huge company. They're a small company, but they're just trying to come out with the most exotic stuff possible. To me, it's like the hypercar of watches. Adrian compares Richard Mill to a condensate. Exactly. For me, ex that's exactly the way I see it too. It's like the hypercar of watches. You know, you're going to buy right now one of those uh, Conisegs, uh one of ones or the Agero, whatever model it is. Yeah, you're going you're to wait a year and then and spend about $4 million. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> and, and, when, and when you buy a watch like, I mean, when you buy a car like that, you're buying innovation, fancy materials, and then, yeah, of course, you know, is this going to be worth anything in 10 years? Well, uh, we don't know. That's like anything in this world. We, we don't know if we're even going to all be here in 10 years. But they, it's definitely, to me, that's what I think. When I see them, I see like they're the hypercar of watches and I personally would like to see what other, you know, when you look at these other brands that done double turbions and stuff like that, I don't think Richard Mill's done that yet. I mean, there's a lot of things that they could still do and I'm positive that they have more up their sleeve that we haven't not. thought about yet. But see, but they're not, see, they're not, they're not, they're trying to do something new. They're not doing a double yeah. turbine or quadruple Correct. turbine like Roger Duby did it. And I'm glad you mentioned the very word innovation. I mean, the RM004 split second chrono alone was an innovation. They redefined what a split second chronograph looks like. And there's so many other things, especially on the higher complicated line that they have innovated over the last years, but people still look at it, oh, it's the rich kid watch, right? It's the trust fund baby watch. It's a young money watch or old money watch, whatever it might be, they still tend to label it. But that's what, that's the same thing that comes with hypercars, which I'm glad you made that analogy because listen, you see a young kid driving down the street in, a, in the latest Lambo, the first thought process that goes into people said, oh, his daddy bought him that car, even though you, this kid may be yeah. a successful businessman on his own, right? This is one of those things. The same thing happened, my son is, he just turned 17, right? At the age of 16, he went and bought himself a Samaritan. When he's out and about, what are the first thing people are thinking? Oh, his daddy got him a Samaritan. But God, his daddy didn't get him a Samaritan because he's been running a successful sneaker business for the last two years, right? So this kid makes enough money where he can afford to buy himself a Rolex and his sister. But perception is everything in the world. People tend to label it is what it is. So when somebody's wearing a Richard Meal or driving a fancy car, the first perception is like, oh, you know, he, I don't know, he, his dad gave him the watch or something like that, especially when somebody's really, really young. It's the ultimate status symbol. And I don't give a shit what anybody says. No matter how modest of a person you may be or how down to earth you may be, if you're out there in a the fancy car or wearing a fancy watch and you're getting look, it still brings you a satisfaction. I, I, never lie, I never lie about that. When I'm out there wearing a fancy watch and somebody said, oh wow, that's a nice watch, I enjoy that. It's human nature, it is what it is. Yeah, well, we like watches, yeah, of course. Exactly, it's, you, listen, you can be as modest as you want, you can be as humble as you want, but at the end of the day, you know, we all work hard and we all wanna play hard. So when we put some of our hard earned money into a fancy car or fancy watch, a reaction from someone else, negative or positive, still gives you a satisfaction. Yeah, w one of my favorite things about Richard Mill is sometimes that the reactions, but some of their innovations are so minute and they're almost not even an innovation. Sometimes it looks like they're going backwards. For example, the 6702 that has the elastic strap I mean, I like that. It's the most simplest thing ever. It's like, are you kidding me? That's, that's what I'm getting. I just did an episode with Adrian of Watch Wars, 
And we talked about that, like, you know, here you are, you got almost a $200,000 watch and you put it on a $3 rubber band. And I said, that's what makes me like Richard Mille even more because I feel like Correct. they have balls to do that kind of stuff. You know, how do you take a $200,000 watch and throw it on the rubber band, basically? And, and that's exactly what you said. I literally just had this conversation with Adrian. I think, I think it's cool. You're, you're wearing that watch that pretty much has an underwear band strap on top from a pair of underwears or something. That's what it is. It almost looks like an elastic strap. And, um, and people look at it and they're just insulted. People that don't understand it are like, you're kidding me. There's no way. And actually, I like that reaction where people don't understand it. They're just like, what the heck is that? To me, that's what for me is always going to have them just totally different. They're just, obviously there's a purpose for that. It's meant to be super ultra light, very thin, and it's not supposed to weigh anything. It's supposed to be simple. That's their meaning behind it. It's a, it's a skier's watch, a runner's watch, stuff like that, you know. I'm never going to do any of those things with that watch on, but I like that. I showed the Alex Pintro, the 67 or two, the white one, the, the, the Alpine skier. I ski. I mean, I know it's a strange thing for Florida to ski, but in Pennsylvania, <laughs> we fucking ski. So we, so I, uh, I put the watch on and I, and I asked myself, am I somebody that's going to put this on and be comfortable skiing it? And the answer was yes. Correct. It would be a watch that I, it's watch A, you don't really feel, it's one of my favorite yeah. RMs today. It's the only other watch that gave me that same feeling uh, uh, before was the Baby Nadal. Like that, the, the very first one that came out. I, I think that thing was so light that I was just like, yeah, I, could, I don't play tennis, but I said, if I were to play tennis, I can see myself playing tennis in this thing. Yes. But look, we can talk about watches for hours. We can talk about Richard Mille for hours. I we can know. talk about a lot of things for hours. But this video is probably going to end up running long. Hope you guys, are, you know, stuck around this far. Uh, this isn't going to be the last video I'm going to do with Eric. We actually had plans for me. I was coming out to Florida uh, while Eric was still with CRM. Uh, and we had a plan to do a collab together in person while I'm in Miami. But Corona happened, and now watch Eric happen. So first and foremost, I want to say a congrats to Eric because I think what I'm low-key jealous a little bit because I think you, you're about to hit the most fun and exciting part of your career. That's that very beginning. Setting up your new store and, 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 and your new YouTube channel. Obviously, all you guys that watch me, I know a lot of you guys watched Eric while he was at CRM. In case you guys didn't know, remember he's now watched Eric on YouTube. Obviously, Ian will link that below or you can just go on my list. I follow him. You'll see where that is. And look, the only thing I'm going to say is... Uh, when this whole nonsense is over around the world and this COVID situation gets under control, for one, I miss Miami. I'm usually in Miami seven to eight times a year and I haven't been there in months at this point. But hopefully by the time, COVID is gonna give you an opportunity to take your time in setting up your new business, setting up your new store. And by the time everything opens back up, I think the next video we should do is should be in your store. You know, I'm gonna come check out the operation and. Uh, uh, and we kind of go from there. But other than that, guys, I appreciate you sticking around. I hope you enjoyed. Like I said, there's no big drama behind the st story of Eric leaving CRM, right? Notice he didn't say anything about it about them and nor are they saying anything about it about Eric. But the bottom line is, is that Eric is now watch Eric. He's now his own boss. He's now has his own business, but he hasn't changed nothing. I've spoken to him many times when he was a CRM and now that he's with his own company, nothing really has changed. And I'm hoping that he climbs to that same hundred thousand. Well, here's the thing. Now I have more followers than you, right? You're, you're what? You're 12 now? I'm, I'm almost <laughs> at 30. But I think Eric will catch up and catch up quickly. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed us. This is just really two watch guys shooting the shit back and forth and just wanted to make a preview of that conversation. But don't forget that for those of you guys that watched him at CRM, not watch him on his own channel, make sure you show him some love over there in case you didn't know. A lot of you guys probably already know that. Eric, I'm going to... I'm going to plan a trip to Miami and then uh, we're going to do this in person some more. Other than that, when the cameras turn off, I got some Richard meals you might want. Yeah, Roman. Thank you, man. I want to thank you for having me on and thank you for all the subscribers for watching us, you know, along the way. All right, Eric. I'll see, I'll, I'll see you in Miami, bro. Thank you, man.